everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this one-hour Quinn Emanuel panel discussion in material development, how Blazchik 2 changes the insider trading landscape. My name is Kurt Wolf. I am of counsel in Quinn Emanuel's Washington, D.C. office and a member of the firm's SEC enforcement practice. Today, I will serve as your moderator for this panel discussion. I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in today and those uh, QE partners who have joined us remotely to participate in the panel discussion. I will introduce them all in just a moment. Before I do introductions, however, I want to give a quick roadmap for today's presentation. For the next hour, we're going to discuss the implications of the Second Circuit's recent decision in a case known as Blaschik 2. The case involves insider trading allegations, and I should note at the outset that insider trading can be a murky area, and reasonable minds may differ about many things in this space, including how to pronounce Blazchik. Uh, you may know it as Blazak, and today we're going to do our best to be consistent, but we're all talking about the same case, so please bear with us. All right, back to the roadmap. In 2020, the Second Circuit held that federal prosecutors may rely on a rarely used criminal securities fraud statute to prosecute insider trading. The court held that political intelligence or non-public information about government deliberations or decisions was property of the government, and that under the criminal statute, insider trading charges could go forward without evidence that someone who shared that political intelligence received a personal benefit in exchange for the tip. This ruling appeared to turn years of insider trading doctrine on its head, and many feared the decision lowered the bar for prosecutors, making it easier to obtain criminal prosecutions than to prevail on civil charges for alleged insider trading. In Blazchik 2, however, the Second Circuit reversed course, overturning the criminal prosecutions. Today, we'll discuss Blazchik and explore its implications for insider trading prosecutions in the future. And spoiler alert, while there has been an awful lot written about this case and quite a few sky is falling memos, I think what you might hear is that it doesn't change the landscape as much as you've heard. A quick pro programming note before we dig in, I'm gonna be monitoring the Zoom chat for any questions you might have, anyone who's tuned in out there, please feel free to send them along and we'll do our best to get to each and every one of them. So, with that prelude, I'd like to take just a moment to introduce our expert panel, who are all joining us today from Quinn Emanuel's Los Angeles offices, although they are <laughs> in different offices. <laughs> I'm gonna just go quick, uh, quickly through um, alphabetically so that we're not playing favorites. Uh, first up is Dan Kaufman. Dan is a partner in our New York office and a member of our white collar criminal defense and government and regulatory litigation teams. Dan advises clients on a broad range of white collar issues and has been involved in a number of high profile insider trading cases, representing traders, corporate insiders and investors who have been prosecuted for securities fraud. Dan regularly acts for both companies and individuals and has tried numerous federal criminal cases to verdict and argued appeals in multiple state and federal appellate courts. Dabney O'Rourden is a partner in our Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. offices and a member of our securities enforcement and white collar criminal defense teams. Dabney specializes in matters involving the asset management industry. She has extensive experience managing investigations and litigation. And before joining Quinn Emanuel in December, Dabney spent more than 17 years at the SEC, where she was the longest serving leader of the SEC Enforcement Division's asset management unit. And last but not least, Kristen Toller is a partner in our LA office and a member of our white collar and government and regulatory litigation teams. Kristen's practice focuses on government regulatory investigations, white collar criminal defense, and matters that involve criminal or quasi-criminal charges, often in cross-border matters. Kristen frequently writes and advises clients on insider trading issues and has for years taken a leading role in high profile white collar litigations. So as you can see, we have a wonderful panel of experts today with deep experience in this space. Uh, I'm excited to hear their insights and thank you all again for being with us. All right, before we get into the Blaschik case, we wanna take just a couple of minutes to orient our, uh, our, our listeners, our attendees to the insider trading landscape for any who may not be familiar. Generally speaking, 
Insider trading happens when a person relies on material non-public information when he or she decides to buy or sell securities. I always think it's helpful to think about this in the classical sense. Someone who works at a company, an insider, learns something important about the company. Maybe it's about the company's financial health. Maybe it's about a potential merger or about a new product or research development that's happening at the company. The insider thinks the information they've learned is material to the company. That is, that the information is likely to impact the price of that company's stock, positively or negatively. And despite knowing that the information is not publicly known, the insider goes out and trades in the stock anyway. Or maybe they tell their cousin or a golfing buddy, and that individual goes out and trades the stock. This makes sense. We've seen this story play out in movies and TV shows. What's interesting is that there's no statutory definition of insider trading. In the US, there is no act or rule that specifically prohibits insider trading. Rather, insider trading is most frequently prosecuted as a violation of general securities fraud provisions found in Title 15 of the US Code, specifically under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 and the rules thereunder. Exchange Act Section 10B includes a general prohibition on the use of any manipulative or deceptive device, scheme, or course of business in connection with the purchase or sale of a security. And Exchange Act Rule 10B or 10B5 prohibits schemes to defraud and any practices that, quote, operate as a fraud or deceit on any persons, end quote. So together, the Exchange Act and rules contain pretty broad don't do fraud provisions that are not exactly tailored to insider trading. It is nevertheless within this framework that the SEC and the DOJ typically bring insider trading cases. It's worth noting that there have been for years calls for Congress to pass a bill that would explain exactly what insider trading is or for the SEC to promulgate a rule or guidance that gives us a little bit more about how to read those elements in the act. But so far, we haven't seen that happen. So over the last several decades, the elements of insider trading violations have been crafted by judges who have been asked to construe that broad anti-fraud prohibition in the Exchange Act. And reading across a broad body of case law, illegal insider trading generally involves the following. Buying or selling a security in breach of a duty or other relationship of trust or confidence on the basis of material non-public information. And I should just say, we'll probably say at different points today, MNPI for material non-public information. Just want to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about if you hear that acronym. So let me break that down a little bit further. Insider trading is the purchase or sale of securities while in possession of information that is material and non-public in breach of a duty of confidence. And it should be, or it must be done knowingly. Those elements are the same whether we're talking about a civil case brought by the SEC or a criminal case brought by the Department of Justice or one of the U.S. Attorney's offices, except the criminal authorities must prove that the trading was willful, while the SEC can rely on the lower standard of recklessness. To understand how these elements fit together, there are a couple core concepts we should just hit on quickly. The first is materiality. Information is material if there is a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor, so not the most sophisticated investor you know, but a reasonable investor, would consider it important in making an investment decision. Another important concept is non-public. Generally, we think of non-public information as information that hasn't been reported in the press. It's not in the company's SEC filings or otherwise known by the market. It's something that's typically only known by a select few insiders. A third concept that isn't in the list I just read you, but we, we should know because it's come out of the case law, is one that we see in the case in cases involving tippers and tippies, and that is the notion of a personal benefit. And essentially, the courts have found that a breach of a duty of confidentiality may occur when an insider will benefit personally, directly or indirectly, from the disclosure of confidential information. So this is the typical kind of quid pro quo. You know, I maybe I'm going to tell Dan something I know that's secret about the company where I work in exchange for a bag of cash or something else of value to me. All right, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. I think those are kind of the core concepts. Again, we wanted to orient 
folks who tuned in today so they understand broadly what is insider trading that may get you in trouble with the SEC or the DOJ. And so with that backdrop, let's get into Blaschek. To understand Blaschek, it's important to understand that the case falls in a category of so-called political intelligence cases. And so we want to explain a little bit what that means. Dabney, the SEC's Division of Enforcement has brought only a handful of cases alleging that individuals or firms engaged in insider trading involving political intelligence. Notably, the SEC's cases against Marwood Group Research and Deerfield Management Company. When we talk about insider trading on political intelligence, what are we talking about? And what is the kind of information that prosecutors are concerned with? Thank you, Kurt. So in general, when we're talking about political intelligence, we're generally talking about information known by government officials that can be used to gain an advantage in market transactions. There's various different types of political intelligence. For example, it just can uh, mean advanced knowledge of regulatory decisions that are going to be made and things of that nature. It's a great concern to the government, both within the SEC and the DOJ regarding the misuse of political intelligence, because it can be significant and lead to um, market issues. So uh, they do take a really hard look at it. We have seen a very limited number of cases that have actually been filed by the SEC and the DOJ regarding true political intelligence. However, that does not mean that there haven't been a considerable number of investigations regarding those issues that have gone on for however long they've gone on for, in which the SEC is taking a hard look at how firms both um, manage their MNPI and the information that they learned and um, whether or not insider trading did occur. Uh, with those two cases that uh, you noted, in particular, both firms were charged with not having adequate policies and procedures to address the potential misuse of material non-public information so that even if in the end inside the, the government isn't going to make a case for insider trading per se, which they also did in those cases, um, they could charge the firm for not having policies and procedures that were adequate in light of the nature of the advisor's business. All right. So that's helpful to put Blazcheck in, in context. And so let's get into Blazcheck a little bit. Um, Dan, you're going to walk us through it. Essentially, there are, there are two pieces of this. There's a piece where there was a criminal trial and an appeal, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And then we'll talk about what happened recently later. But Dan, why don't you give us a little bit of the background on the, the prosecution, the allegations, the charges the first time around? Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Um, so the Blaschik case was, um, you know, Dabney mentioned the SEC investigation and charges against Deerfield. And the Blaschik case involved two um, principles of Deerfield, along with David Blaschik, who was a political intelligence consultant and a former um, employee of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, um, known as CMS. And essentially what the government charged was that Blaschek was getting information from a former colleague at CMS um, that was market moving information. Some of it related to um, reimbursement rates and the dialysis issues um, that the, um, the traders at Deerfield and one other fund were able to use to, you know, trade ahead of the market. And so um, there were, the government had a few cooperators um, and they ultimately charged the two, two people from Deerfield, the CMS employee and Mr. Blaschek and with a range of, of charges that I think it was an 18 count indictment that included not only the traditional 10B5 insider trading that you explained, Kurt, but included wire fraud. It included um, Title 18 securities fraud, uh, which is a separate provision of the criminal code 
that criminalizes um, defrauding anybody in connection with trade or sale of a commodity or a security. So an independent um, statute that is often used or, or can be used to charge insider trading, um, as well as some conspiracy counts. So pretty significant um, indictment. Four defendants went to trial before Judge Kaplan, and it was essentially a split verdict. Um, each defendant was convicted on at least some count. Um, nobody was convicted on the 10B5 insider trading counts, um, but everybody was convicted on some form of, of fraud. The um, an, an appeal ensued, and in the Second Circuit, those convictions initially were affirmed, um, and the principal arguments that were teed up for the Second Circuit were, number one, whether insider trading under Title 18, the independent charge under 1348 um, that can be used for securities fraud, whether that required proof of personal benefit, um, like you were talking about, Kurt, is required for 10b-5 insider trading, as well as whether the information that Blaschek obtained from his former colleague at CMS, again, which related to sort of information about what CMS was going to set as a reimbursement rate, how they were going to um, regulate certain aspects of Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement policies, whether that kind of information qualified as property or a thing of value. Um, and that was important because the wire fraud and the securities fraud counts require the government to prove that, that somebody was defrauded out of property. And the property that the government alleged was this, what, what what's known as pre-decisional information. Um, so as I said, Second Circuit affirmed the convictions originally. Um, then there was an intervening Supreme Court decision in Kelly, the Bridgegate case, which, which Kristen will talk about in a minute. Um, but after that Supreme Court decision, the defendants in the Blaschik case said to the Supreme Court, um, you know, you need to resolve our case too, because this is all different. The law is different now that Kelly's been decided. Um, and ultimately, the Solicitor General's office agreed that the case should go back to the Second Circuit to be reconsidered in light of the Kelly decision. Um, and so that's how ultimately it went back to the Supreme Court. But I'll, I'll pause there and let Kristen give some more background on Kelly. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so I think we do need to segue for just a minute to talk about Kelly. And Kristen, I, I, you're going to take us through it. I imagine some of our attendees, maybe all of them, have heard of the Bridgegate case, which is Kelly versus U.S. But just to make sure everyone's on the same page, can you give us a little bit of background on Bridgegate before we get into the ruling? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Curtin. Thanks, Dan. Um, Bridgegate was the 2013, actually, episode when a couple of aides of then Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey um, shut down two bridge lanes on the GW Bridge going in from Fort Lee, New Jersey into New York. Although at the time this was called a traffic study and that the lane closures were part of a traffic study, it was later alleged that the aides had done this to get back at the mayor of Fort Lee, who was less than enthusiastic about then Governor Christie's um, re-election campaign. And so the, uh, the prosecutions ensued and they were prosecuted under Title 18 wire fraud prosecutions. <laughs> So what was the outcome of the Kelly case? Yeah, in Kelly, um, the court considered the property question that Dan had referred to before, and specifically the question of whether or not the lanes of traffic could be considered property for purposes of Title 18. 
the Supreme Court in looking at this found that they did not uh, constitute um, property. The government had argued that they did, that the aides had commandeered the lanes and that it had cost the government um, in terms of payments to workers who had to work during that time and other costs of the realignment. The Supreme Court found that the that was not correct, that this was actually an exercise of regulatory power and that such decision making in the, this regulatory context could not constitute the taking of property for purposes of Title 18. So it, it feels like we are a little far afield from insider trading um, or talking about traffic lanes. So uh, bring us back. Why, why do we care about Kelly v. U.S.? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, going back to what Dan had talked about before, it is, it's obviously not the overlap factually. There, there's not lane closures versus alleged insider trading, but instead it is this overall question of what can constitute property for the purposes of Title 18. And so, as Dan had said, in light of Kelly, the defendants in Blazacek asked the Supreme Court to reconsider the case in you know in light of in light of that their finding and arguing that in fact their the property in the Blazacek case could not be considered um property for for the same under the same reasoning as was in Kelly. All right. So the Supreme Court ultimately uh, sends it back down to the Second Circuit and says, you know, take another look at Blazacek in light of Kelly and and our holding with respect to property. Um, so Dabney, what happens there once once it gets back to the Second Circuit? How did they rule? First, talking about what the government did, the, and the government in the context of the recent Kelly decision in Blastjack conceded that the information in the Blastjack case was not property or a thing of value. They explained that while CMS did have an economic interest in its confidential pre-decisional information, given the time and effort put into that work, however, that time and effort was not the object of the fraud. So while the government conceded those points, the government didn't just walk away from the case. Rather, it asked the court to affirm the conspiracy charges be because those were based on Title 15 of securities fraud and defrauding the U.S. under Section 371. So, uh, Dan, I want to segue to you just for a second. I mean, can you tell me how unusual is it for, for prosecutors to sort of walk away from charges like this? I mean, they basically put their hands up and said, we got it wrong. But what's going on there? Sorry. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's it's not unheard of. Um, it does happen. It's not extremely common. I wish it were more common in my cases. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, so the question was asked kind of not quite so directly, um, but at oral argument on remand, Judge Sullivan asked um, the deputy solicitor general who was arguing in the Second Circuit, which in and of itself is is somewhat unusual. Typically, the U.S. Attorney's Office would handle the argument. But here, um, you can sort of see, reading between the lines, um, that the U.S. Attorney's Office was not pleased that the Solicitor General had taken this position. Um, and so the, de the Deputy Solicitor General basically said, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can, and we don't we didn't take this decision lightly, but in light of the Kelly decision, we don't see a principled basis for distinguishing between a regulatory decision, which in a you know the, a unanimous um, decision of the Supreme Court said is not property. We can't distinguish between the decision and information relating to the decision. And so we think that we can't sustain um, sort of property fraud cases, which is not only 1348, but affects um, mail and wire fraud as well, um, that those can't be sustained on, on the basis of that kind of information. And um, so I think, you know, it's partly it is 
just a, a principled or an attempt at principled reading of a Supreme Court decision. But I think they were comforted by the fact that you know, they sort of feel like there are other tools in the toolbox that prosecutors can use to get at this same conduct. All right, so that's helpful context. Um, Dabney, I think now you can you can maybe answer the big question from a minute ago. So it's finally in, in front of the Second Circuit. We've got this interesting dynamic where, you know, the Solicitor General has, has sent someone to argue the AUSAs have kind of walked away from it. Um, and, and the defendants, of course, are arguing that these charges should go away altogether. So what happens in the Second Circuit? Well, the three-judge panel was very split on the issues presented in the case and the, and the government's position. Um, as Dan noted, uh, Judge Sullivan had a lot of um, consternation regarding the government's position. And at a high level, uh, it was a 2-1 vote. The court granted the DOJ's request to dismiss the convictions based on the information being um, not being property or a thing of value in, value in light of Kelly. Notably, the Judge Sullivan dissented, even though the DOJ conceded the point after Kelly. Um, the, the panel also denied the DOJ's request to affirm the conspiracy charges on which the jury had rendered guilty ver verdicts. However, the court also denied the defendant's request that the conspiracy charges be dismissed. So in the end, the court remanded the remaining conspiracy charges for the trial court to decide what to do next. And overall, the Blaschak case is not over. The district court is going to decide what to do about the remaining conspiracy charges and the SEC civil case against the individuals remains pending. Given the lower burden of proof, the SEC could go forward on its charges even though the defendants were acquitted for the 10b-5 charges in the criminal case. And whether the SEC decides to go forward with that is yet to be seen. All right, I won't ask you to uh, place a bet on what's going to happen over, over there, Dabney, and you probably can't talk about it anyway. Uh, but it will certainly be interesting to, to follow along. Um, so I think we find ourselves, you know, in an interesting moment here. Um, you know, the case, I think, for for many purposes is sort of final, right? We know uh, where we're gonna come down, at least on this title, title 18 question. And so I think Christian, there's just a, a question about what to make of it all. You know, I mentioned up top, there have been an awful lot of sky is falling type of memos and client alerts going out. But, um, you know, what, what do we think of Blaschik too? Is it really, is it really changing things? I know it, it was a little bit of a spoiler card. Um, indeed, <laughs> I think there there has been a lot of sky and sky is falling. I'm not sure that the sky is falling, and I'm not sure that it's skies. If that's the opposite, um, I think that as Dabney noted, there is still a lot left to the Blazcheck case to be decided. I think that there are a lot of you know potential prosecutions that can still arise surrounding political intelligence. So. One should not take a lot of, you know, from it in terms of changing policies or procedures. But on the other hand, it's not the sky is falling in terms of you can't ever use this. So it is it's it's, you know, um, I think there's still a lot to be decided and a lot to know. But I, I don't think that we are in that sky is falling world uh, right now. Um, it's also an open question just in terms of how this gets um, ultimately interpreted by other circuits and, you know, kind of going forward. So I think that the overreaction of sky is falling, or I'm sorry, sky is falling may be an overreaction, but I think that there is still um, a lot to be learned um, and a lot to see going forward and how it ultimately plays out. So, I mean, I think, I think what I hear you saying is if, you know, you're somebody who, you know, works at a hedge fund or, you know, sort of out there trading for his or her own account. Maybe there's not, not much that should change right now. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, it's, a, I'm, I'm obviously interested too in, in what Dan and Dabney have as far as their thoughts on this. I know we're going to get more into that, but it's hard to see right now from this exactly what should change or, you know, clear guidance in terms of this exactly should change vis-a-vis -vis the practical aspect of it, you know, policies, procedures, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, Dan, Kristen, I think is talking a little bit about what folks in the, in the market maybe should be thinking or, or how they should adjust their, their conduct, if at all. Um, 
But with respect to what prosecutors might be thinking or doing, what do you think are are the implications of this case? Yeah, well, I think I think that's the right question um, because I think it it is it partially answers the question of what should people in the market be thinking about, um, and I think that by its terms, Blaschek has no impact on traditional 10b5 insider trading. The defendants were acquitted on those counts. Obviously, the government can't appeal an acquittal. Um, so, you know, those issues never reached the Second Circuit. Um, and obviously, Kelly had nothing to do with insider trading. So I think for, you know, thinking about compliance issues and how to structure um, systems and processes to ensure that people on the market are not um, committing insider trading, you know, the big one, the elephant in the room, I think has always been 10B5. And, and that I think is relatively unchanged. I'm sure that there are going to be defendants and maybe I'll be arguing this one day soon. Um, people may try to argue that this um, sort of pre-decisional information and the regulatory decision-making that was at issue in Kelly and was, um, you know, then became an issue in Blaschek, that that sort of case law should be applied in the 10b-5 context. Um, I don't, I wouldn't be too sanguine about the likelihood that courts will adopt that reasoning. I think that there's a pretty substantial amount of case law that distinguishes between the purpose of 10b-5 as opposed to um, you know, Title 18 securities fraud and other property fraud statutes. Um, so I think by and large, you know, it, this will probably make prosecutors think twice about including a 1348 count in an, an indictment where they're otherwise charging 10b-5 insider trading. Um, but those cases are going to continue and, and 10b-5 has long been um, a favorite in these types of cases. So. Uh, absolutely right. Um, okay, so I, I mean, we're talking a little bit about sort of high level, what's the impact on insider trading prosecutions, um, just across the board. But maybe let's, let's go down a, a little bit and focus on these types of political intelligence cases in particular. You know, Dabney, before Blaschik, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, there were rumors that we were going to see this wave of political intelligence insider trading cases uh, from the SEC in particular. And then when Blaschek finally came out, I think a lot of people thought maybe that was the, the tip of the spear and we were going to see a lot more of these kinds of cases. It, it hasn't really happened that way. We haven't seen a wave of political intelligence insider trading cases. So I guess I, I don't know what we should think now, Dabney. What's your view on that? Well, I, I think people should feel confident that the SEG, SEC and in turn the DOJ are still going to be looking hard at firms and traders who use political intelligence in a manner that suggests possible insider trading. That is going to continue. And as I noted before, with Blastcheck in particular, the SEC's case is still pending, and that is based on 10b-5 charges. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in that uh, with respect to that case. More generally, the SEC has devoted quite a bit of resources to rooting out what they consider to be abuses in this area. There's an entire specialized unit within the SEC dedicated to finding, investigating, and charging insider trading cases generally that has developed highly effective tools at identifying potential misuse. And the SEC has shown an overall willingness to charge novel cases or cases that are viewed as aggressive in the insider trading space. At minimum, the SEC will continue to look hard at investment advisors and whether they have adequate policies and procedures regarding the use of material non-public information in light of the nature of their business. So if you as a, in a, as a business rely on political intelligence and in, in doing your trading, you need to have a robust policy and procedure around ensuring your information is not misusing the MNPI. Again, it's gonna subject you to potential investigation, which is costly and time consuming. 
and that could result in findings by the commission or a litigated action. Okay, so I mean, it sounds like there's always this uh, this threat that the SEC is going to uh, to find you out or take action, and and even just an investigation can be disruptive and and expensive. Um, but you know, again, we haven't seen much of that. It seems like DOJ has bumped into a stumbling block. So, I mean, Kristen, what do you think? I mean, I don't. I guess the question isn't is it open season right for political intelligence, but are things a little bit easier now? Is it a safer space? I mean, I think on the open season question, Kurt, we certainly can't and wouldn't advise that it that it is open season. I think a too broad reading of Blazicek is is ill advised and you know could could be really problematic a lot for the reasons that Dabney was just alluding to. Um, we've talked a little bit about it, but Judge Sullivan had a very strong dissent in the Blazicek case and basically counseled against and warned against this idea of a potential open season as a result of, of the majority's ruling. And in fact, talked about, you know, the, the potential repercussions of this. So I think it's to be seen as to whether other circuits will follow maybe this logic or even how you know prosecutors will look at this going forward and will craft indictments or the like in order to fit into to the kind of new rubric. So um I I think you know it is it's a little difficult to say obviously going forward, but it certainly is not just open season with regard to all political intelligence going forward. It's an interesting point um, thinking about how prosecutors might craft indictments and in maybe this slightly different paradigm. I mean, Dan, on that score, what's your perspective? I asked you about how they might charge, you know, sort of generally insider trading in a post-plastic too, but thinking about political intelligence cases in particular, what, what do you think is on prosecutors' minds? So I think there's always 10 v 5 and I would expect to see that again. Um, I think you can also, you know, 10 v 5 requires, as you said, proof of a personal benefits. Um, but if you think about it in the context of political intelligence and government agencies, providing a personal benefit in exchange for confidential government information is also sometimes called bribery. So I think you can see honest services wire fraud cases. You can see other charges that are bribery related charges. Um, and there's also section 371 the conspiracy statute. That applies not only in a conspiracy to commit any federal crime, um, but there's the, the second clause of section 371 is called the defraud clause, sometimes known as a Klein conspiracy, where if you're, if the conspiracy relates to um, sort of frustrating the functioning of a government agency, um, that's another another basis for liability that you could imagine here. And I think we may see on remand um, from the, the, sec, the blast check two, that 371 charge survives. Um, the way it was charged in the indictment, there were three objects. There was conspiracy to obtain government property, conspiracy to commit 10B5, and then conspiracy to defraud CMS. Um, Obviously, the obtaining government property prong is no longer available, but the government can still retry these defendants on, or at least the ones who were previously convicted on those counts, um, on a theory that they conspired to commit 10b5 insider trading or that their conduct, um, that the conspiracy basically was designed to defraud CMS. Um, and I think that you know, I would expect them to proceed down that path. Obviously, I don't I don't know um, that they will, but I think I would expect them to do it in this case, and I would expect them to do it in similar political intelligence cases in the future. So I think together what I hear you all saying is that this is not a safe space, despite uh, where we are with Blazczyk too, right? The SEC has tools to find out this kind of conduct and an interest in pursuing these cases. You know, on, from the criminal side, yes, you have 10B5, but you also have 
you know, the Title 18 securities fraud statutes on a services fraud conspiracy, a number of other types of charges that criminal prosecutors might bring, you know, with the right fact pattern, but broadly within within this space. Um, so maybe there's there's a takeaway for folks who are listening at home is, you know, this hasn't uh, hasn't really changed things in a sense that it's not OK uh, to, to go out there and do this kind of trading, or at least we don't think it is. And folks need to still be paying attention. And so what we want to do now is talk a little bit about how uh, maybe firms or individuals should be thinking about their own practices or their policies and procedures in this. Um, I don't want to say new world, but I'll just say post blast check too. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about, about best practices. I know we've got some in-house compliance and legal folks who turned in today. Um, Kristen, I'm going to start with you. I mean, just thinking broadly from a compliance perspective, what should firms be doing? How should they be vetting information? What are the kinds of red flags that you've seen or clients have seen that, that sort of make you nervous? Yeah, um, you know, I, I feel like this is a little bit of a theme for today, but I'm not sure that there's that much different in terms of the compliance perspective. I think that firms need to continue being very vigilant with policies and procedures with what they have in place to test and check um, the information that they're using. And I think that part of that too is not only having the, the paper documents and the policies, the procedures, but actually making sure that they're implemented, making sure that people understand um, you know, what this means and, and what they can be doing and can be doing. And if they you know, have questions, how those needs to be raised, et cetera, so that it is a little bit more of an active dialogue back and forth as, as among the, the group, as opposed to just policies and procedures kind of sitting off somewhere and then people doing whatever they're, they're going to do. Um, I, I wouldn't relax, you know, the policies and procedures or, or uh, compliance materials, um, you know, dramatically in light of this or change them dramatically because that could inadvertently create other blind spots or, or issues with respect to some of the other issues that we've been talking about, which are still very much um, alive and, and potential problems. So assuming firms have in place these policies and procedures, you know, they're effectively monitoring, they've got the right kind of oversight framework in place, it's still possible that someone within a firm could come into possession of material non-public information. So Dan, if that happens, if a firm learns that one of its employees does in fact have MNPI, what are next steps? What should they be doing? Well, I think, um, I think you have to understand how how the person obtained that MNPI first and foremost, um, you know, it's one thing to sort of hear something inadvertently. It's another thing if it's a consultant that you have on retainer for the purpose of getting inside information or, or getting confidential information. Obviously, the latter um, is is going to be very problematic, but the former may not be. Um, you know, there are. There are decisions um, that have said it is not insider trading if you learn even material non-public information, if you earn if you learn it through you know inadvertent or otherwise kind of innocent means or not, it's not disclosed in exchange for a personal benefit, um, then that may be something that you can consider um, and you can, can you can trade on, but it will depend heavily on on that fact, I think, first and foremost. So I'm going to ask you a slightly different version of the same question. You know, question one was, what if somebody has it? So question two is, what if somebody actually trades on it? Then, then what should a firm do? Well, that's a harder question. Um, I think, it's, you know, same analysis applies in, in sort of establishing whether there is exposure. Um, but you know, it is, it's a challenging question and it depends on the circumstances of every case to, to figure out um, when it makes sense to self-report and whether it's something that is in um, a client's best interest in that moment. So I, I think that's, that's sort of a separate analysis um, and strategic question, but 
you know, obviously the first step would be assessing whether there is liability um, and then moving on to whether there's exposure, exposure for the individual, exposure for the firm, and kind of figuring out um, the best way to proceed. Uh, you know, Dabney, I want to kick it to you because I know Kristen and Dan have kind of been talking about the firm perspective or what they should do. But I wonder if you have any any final thoughts here or, or even want to kind of like sum up what they're saying. Uh, sure. No. Um, in terms of just adding on to what Dan said, I, I definitely would um, counsel someone to go talk to their lawyer if they uh, believe that MNPI was used in making a trade, especially if it was an investment advisor making a trade for the client um, based on MNPI. That is a, a lot of thought and care needs to go into evaluating what to do under those circumstances. But in general, uh, the one thing I wanted to note as well is that, and I think if we, you know, Kristen and Dan have both raised these points, is that the government did not concede that political intelligence will never be property or a thing of value. They really limited their concession to the facts of the blast check case. And they didn't even concede the conspiracy charges. So I don't think blast check and how it came out should be interpreted as the government is gonna take their foot off the pedal in terms of prosecuting and investigating these types of cases. And as Kristen noted, this was a decision in the second circuit only. And we've seen splits between the circuits before in insider trading cases, which seems even more likely here given this rather strong split amongst the three judge panel in the second circuit. So for me, the takeaway, at least for advisors in particular that have an interest in using political intelligence, they should carefully consider the costs of getting close to the line in terms of the time and cost to defend an investigation or case, even if ultimately no charges are brought. And they need to be prepared to have answers for the SEC and potentially the DOJ about their policies, procedures, and how they apply them in particular situations given the type of business that they have and type of information that they get. As I noted before, the market abuse unit within the SEC is very actively looking and investigating cases that are suspicious of insider trading. And with respect to advisors, you also have the SEC examination staff looking hard into this area. The examination program has issued at least two public risk alerts specifically addressing MNPI compliance issues, including as recently as April of 2022. So they will be looking for potential issues, even if it is a um, just a deficient policy or the policy wasn't implemented properly. Um, and then, you know, and just to put a finer point on that, the exam 2022 priorities specifically included MNPI policies when firms are using alternative data or data gleaned from non-traditional sources as part of their business and their investment um, decision-making process. So not only do you have the market abuse unit and their intelligence that they do um, and bring to the table, but you also have an SEC exam program that is actively looking at MNPI issues. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's no reason, as you said, Dabney, for anyone uh, to believe that the prosecutors or the SEC, are, they're going to take their foot off the pedal. I think it's going to remain full speed ahead. And so firms uh, should keep doing what they're doing. Even, you know, now that we've heard from the Second Circuit in Blastic 2, I think folks should stay the course in terms of, you know, their policies and procedures and oversight. Um, okay, so we've got... Yeah. Uh, Kurt, Kurt, can I just add one point? Yeah, please. So I, I actually, I think Dabney's point about a potential circuit split is a, is a really good one because, um, you know, although it's not true for prosecutors in the Southern District of New York or, or other offices within the Second Circuit, they can't pick and choose where to take their cases. Um, often DOJ fraud section can, um, and they're a very active office in terms of prosecuting insider trading and securities fraud. And obviously, there are limitations. They can't go anywhere. They have to have venue, but they have more flexibility. Um, and I think you will, you may see more of these types of cases brought outside the Second Circuit um, for that very reason. And when they get, when if they go up on appeal, if there are convictions and they go on appeal, Judge Sullivan's dissent is, um, you know, it has a lot of appeal to it. And I think, um, you know, you could easily see this case 
coming out the other way. In fact, it did the first time. <laughs> and Judge Sullivan wrote the majority opinion the first time. And, and in some ways, I think the part of what happened here is the original panel was Judge Sullivan, Judge Kearse, and Judge Droney. In the interim, Judge Droney went back into private practice, left the bench, and Judge Walker replaced him. And whereas in the first blast check, Judge Sullivan wrote the majority and Judge Kearse dissented. In blast check two, Judge Kearse is in the majority and Judge Sullivan is dissenting. Um, not to suggest that the mere switch of judge is the reason that the outcome was different. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think some, some people who are otherwise um, you know, aligned with Judge Sullivan's analysis may see the outcome come here as partially unfair for the government and that it was due maybe in some small part to a change in the composition of the panel. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with that, Dan. And I think maybe one of the biggest takeaways from this is Judge Sullivan's dissent and looking at that in terms of when there are cases brought in other circuits, you know, how, how those uh, you know, who knows how they're going to come out, but it certainly is a very, you know, lengthy, thoughtful and, and reasoned dissent um, and going the other way. So I think that that, you know, gives some some potential guidance going forward to in cases elsewhere. Uh, well, well, maybe that'll be a case coming to a, a court right here in the district where I am. <laughs> I would imagine you'd have venue here, because I think most of that information is coming from uh, from somewhere around mm -hmm. here. Um, we, we've got a couple of minutes left, and I do have uh, at least one question I, I want to throw out. Um, I'll, I'll direct this one, uh, you know, to Dan and Kristen. You know, Dan, I know that you've tried some of these cases, and Kristen, you've litigated a bunch. But, uh, you know, I think a question is, it, it seems like insider trading cases are hard for the government to, to win, right? If, and if you think about this on the SEC side, they're the cases that individuals most often push back on. And sometimes they they beat the SEC in those cases. So I don't know. The question is, is it worth it to, to roll the dice in these cases and, and force prosecutors to uh, to meet their, their burden of proof, to, to prove the case before a jury? Well, um, I think, I mean, yes, obviously. And you should hire Quinn Emanuel to represent you at trial. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think, I think, yeah, you're right. These cases often are tribal. They often require um, a cooperator to, you know, prove up that there was an agreement. Um, and so I think, you know, in those cases, they're often, people can always point to so many different pieces of information that they were relying on as, as opposed to the MNPI. Um, so I do think these cases are, are often triable. Um, you know, doesn't mean that the government isn't likely to win. I think the government is always likely to win at trial and the numbers bear that out. Um, but it, if you're otherwise inclined to put the government to its burden, I think you could do worse than an insider trading case. Kristen. I completely agree. And I, you know, I I don't know, I'd call it roll the dice as opposed to look at the facts and the circumstances of the case. And a lot of these cases, you know, frankly, should be fought and should be defended because the government got it wrong. Um, and when you have that case, when you do have all of those defenses, I think it, this is certainly a landscape where you can assert those those defenses with success. So, um, so yes, I mean, I, I think that there is certainly room for for very strong defense um, on, on depending upon what your facts and circumstances are. Uh, Dabney, I won't ask you to weigh in on the SEC's success rate in insider trading cases in particular, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sort of looking at the clock. I don't know that we have enough time to get through another question. Uh, I will open the floor in case any of the panelists have any kind of closing remarks that they would like to give before we close the webinar. Okay. 
Um, well, with that, I think we're going to call time on this panel discussion. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. Uh, special thanks to our wonderful, our wonderful panel all out in L.A. Um, just for those listening, if you have a friend or a colleague who might be interested in or benefit from this webinar, we are going to post it on YouTube shortly. So please feel free to share. Uh, if you have questions after this, please feel free to reach out to any one of us directly. We'd be more than happy to discuss. Thank you again, everyone. Have a good day and hope to see you soon.